recording in progress. April 25th to 2023 Eugene Planning Commission meeting. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Daniel Isaacson and I am the chair of the Eugene Planning Commission. To begin this evening, I'd like to call on Commissioner Beeson for the city's land acknowledgement statement. Commissioner Beeson. Thank you. Since time immemorial, the Kalapuya people have been the indigenous stewards to our region, building dynamic communities, maintaining balance with wildlife and enacting sustainable land practices. This land acknowledgement is a way of resisting the erasure of indigenous histories and to honor native communities by inviting truth, and reconciliation. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government, forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. As we consider the impacts of colonization, we also acknowledge the strength and resiliency of displaced indigenous people. The city of Eugene is built within the traditional homelands known as the Kalapuya Illahi. Kalapuya descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. They continue to make contributions in our communities here and across the lands. We express our respect for the inherent political sovereignty of all federally recognized tribal nations and indigenous people who live in the state of Oregon and across the nation. Therefore, the Planning Commission recognizes that what we do today will affect the many generations who will come after us. Thank you, Commissioner Reason. And thanks to everyone for joining us in this hybrid meeting format. Today, our meeting will begin with public comment, followed by a work session on a proposed amendment to the Downtown Urban Renewal Plan. There are several housekeeping announcements and instructions related to the meeting format that I need to take care of first. Thank you for your patience while I work our way through them. Anyone wishing to join us and meet us online can do so by following the instructions listed on the agenda for this meeting. Planning Commission meetings can also be viewed by watching the live stream available on our website or on the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21. For those who are joining via computer, device, or phone, or your microphone, webcam, and phone are automatically muted when you enter the meeting as an attendee. If you wish to participate during the public comment portion of the meeting and haven't done so already, please do so by raising your virtual hand now to join the speaker's queue in one of two ways. For those viewing the meeting on a computer, laptop, or other device, click on the blue hand icon. For those listening to the meeting on a phone, press star nine. Public comment is an, is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the Planning Commission on topics except for items scheduled for public hearing or public hearing items for which the record has already closed. As a reminder, you, your hand must be raised to be in the queue for public comment. Uh, to staff, uh, is anyone waiting to provide public comment? So we have no attendees currently. Sorry, you cut off there. Uh, no attendees? No attendees. Great. Um, as always, if you feel to the need to contact staff, if you have any other comments you'd like to provide that you were not able to um, or would like to do in a different manner, I will now close the public comment and ask for comments uh, from any planning commissioners if there are any, which I don't see any. Moving on to our next agenda item, I'd like to turn over it over to Amanda D'Souza to begin the staff presentation. Following the staff presentation, the commission will have the opportunity to ask questions and provide a recommendation. Amanda? Great, thank you. Uh, let me pull up a PowerPoint. Do you see that? Yes. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. My name is Amanda D'Souza. I am the, the Development Programs Manager in Community Development, and we are here to talk to you about a proposed amendment to the Downtown Urban Renewal Plan. So we have a presentation for you, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end. So this process started in uh, 2022. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but as the downtown uh, city council was talking about the future of the downtown urban renewal district um, and uh, directed staff to bring back uh, a list of priorities and projects for the downtown area. So in response to this, we launched the downtown priorities and projects last fall. And through this process, we talked to a number of community members 
through interviews, focus groups, and an open house. And so we were able to engage with over 2,000 community members, talking with residents, employees, businesses, social ser service providers, and other stakeholders with an interest in downtown. Through that outreach process, there were six categories that emerged, housing, public safety, social services, commercial activity and development, public space and mobility, and events and culture. And within each category, there are priorities and projects listed, and we've included that list in your packet today. Through those discussions, those top three categories, housing, public safety, and social services, quickly rose to the top as being of the highest priority. The city's working to address all six of these categories, but right, is really focused on the short-term efforts on these top three. Urban Renewal is one of the tools we have to address some of these projects. And before I get into the proposed amendment though, I'll pass it to Anne, who will give an overview of what we mean when we say urban renewal. Thanks, Amanda. I'm Anne Fifield. I'm the Economic Development Manager in the Community Development Division here at the city. And so we're focused tonight on amending the downtown urban renewal plan, which will use urban renewal to address the priorities that Amanda just walked through. And so for those of you, I'll give a little bit of 101 on urban renewal. It has a lot of like funny little complexities and hope we're gonna give you a high level summary that hopefully should give you enough information to sort of understand what we're doing with it. Urban renewal is a tool that focuses property tax revenue into a specific geography and urban renewal district. This map shows the downtown urban renewal district it goes west from Lincoln, north up to 6th, south down to 11th, east to Pearl, and it has a small arm that goes out to High and 8th Avenue. In an urban renewal district, the district collects what's known as tax increment. Urban renewal is also known as tax increment financing or TIF. Urban renewal uses TIF or tax increments to fund specific capital improvements in an urban renewal district. I'll use this chart to explain some of the urban renewal basics. So the vertical axis shows property tax revenue and the horizontal shows time. The first thing you do in an urban renewal district after you define the boundary is you determine the assessed taxable value in that district. This is called the frozen base. It's the taxable assessed value in year one and revenue from that value goes to all the overlapping tax taxing districts, which includes the city and the county and school district 4J. The frozen base doesn't change over time, it's frozen. That revenue from the frozen base goes to those overlapping districts throughout the life of the urban renewal district. But over time, the taxable assessed value grows. That revenue from that incremental value goes to the urban renewal district, and that's why it's called tax increment. The tax revenue from the increment is a tool to fund capital projects in the district. It's a useful tool to fund improvements to buildings and infrastructure. It cannot be used to fund operations like police officers. It cannot fund projects outside the district. It can be used to fund projects that are identified in the urban renewal plan, which Amanda will discuss in detail. The plan spells out what the increment can be spent on and how much can be spent. An urban renewal plan has to identify a total spending limit, which is called its maximum indebtedness. It doesn't require that the district have a debt limit, just a spending limit, but urban renewal has lots of language very specific to urban renewal and is sort of useless anywhere outside of the context of urban renewal. The district can either borrow funds upfront or use a pay as you go method but once it has spent up to its maximum indebtedness limit and paid any of the associated debt, the district expires. When the district expires, the incremental taxable value goes back to the overlapping taxing districts. We're here tonight to discuss amending the current urban renewal plan, which will increase the maximum indebtedness limit and extend the life of the district. I'll hand it back to Amanda, who will discuss the proposed amendment to the downtown urban renewal district's plan. Uh, and so just to reiterate what Anne said, so urban renewal can be used for the purchase of real property, rehab or construction, site improvements and infrastructure improvements, and they must be included in the plan in order to be eligible. And what's in the plan can either be broad, so say something like infrastructure, or it could be something specific 
like high speed fiber, which is one of the projects in the current plan. So I'll give a quick big picture overview of the district. The current spending limit, also known as maximum indebtedness, is $66 million. It was last increased in the 2016 amendment, which added 19.4 million. The downtown urban renewal plan was last amended in 2016 when eligible activities were limited to four specific projects, each with their own spending cap. And in 2020, when the farmer's market spending cap was removed. The, the district expires when the spending limit is met, which is forecast to happen this December, which brings us to the proposed amendment. As we mentioned, the agency board voted to formally initiate a plan amendment process on April 12th. Throughout this presentation, you'll hear me say both council and the agency board. They're technically separate bodies, but in Eugene, the council acts as the agency board. That's not always the case in other jurisdictions. So when the agency board initiated the amendment, that started a process that's outlined in the state statutes that require we present to you, the planning commission, among other steps that I'll touch on later. There's a lot in your packet, so I'll try to clarify what the documents are. The main amendment document council is considering is attachment A. Attachment B is the report that accompanies the plan, which offers a lot of supplemental information for the plan, outlining things like financial impacts. Attachment C is the current version of the plan, which is just provided as a reference. And knowing that it's all very complicated and hard to tell the documents apart, we've included attachment D, which essentially outlines the main components of, components of the amendment, which I'll cover now. So to identify the projects that could be included in the proposed amendment, we looked to the down priorities and project efforts from last fall. Based on what we heard, the amendment includes three proposed project focus area buckets, housing, physical improvements to address safety and comfort, and then emerging projects, which would be initiated by the agency board. I'll talk through these, through these in a little bit more detail and what implementation would look like if the plan is amended. So during the public outreach last fall, to no one's surprise, housing emerged as one of the most important priorities in downtown. We heard it was important the city support the creation of a mix of new housing affordable across income levels. So to address this, this bucket includes two new possible projects to support the creation of housing. The first is development fee assistance, which would pay for government imposed development fees for new housing, such as system development charges and permit fees. And the second is real property acquisition, which would allow the agency board to acquire property and offer it for reduced or no cost for new housing development. Both of these efforts help to offset construction costs to make housing projects financially feasible. Should the plan be approved, both projects would require agency board direction and decisions before they can be implemented. For development fee assistance, staff would work with the agency board to establish the program, including eligibility criteria, and agency board action would be required before acquiring or offering any real property for housing. The next bucket is physical improvements to address safety and comfort. This allows the agency to make physical improvements to street, curb, sidewalks, and other right-of-way in the plan area to create safe and accessible and welcoming spaces for users. Improvements can include street, curb, alley, and sidewalks, and, and projects that would address safety and comfort could include lighting and alleys, fixing the pavements, or adding planting and landscaping. If the plan was approved, projects in this bucket would be implemented on an as-needed basis, and then agency board approval would be needed for any projects over $250,000. The third focus area bucket is referred to as emerging projects, which would be a directed or initiated by the agency board. These can be considered projects that align on priorities and that the agency board could pursue in the medium to long term, in contrast to housing and the physical improvement projects, which we expect will begin being implemented in the nearer term. This bucket could include supporting the development of community facilities, such as convention center improvements or expansion. The agency board could also choose to pursue revitalization of the open spaces, including implement implementation of projects that were identified in the 2016 Project for Public Spaces report, Places for People, which included things like redevelopment of the park blocks. And then finally, finally, agency board could provide financial assistance to support the revitalization of vacant storefronts and underutilized properties. 
If the proposed plan amendment were approved, the agency board would need to provide direction before anything in this bucket could move forward. All three of these subcategories require additional study and strategy before they could be pursued. And by including them in the plan amendment now, these projects would become eligible for urban renewal funds, meaning the board could choose to initiate them without having to go back and amend the plan. The final piece we'll touch on is the proposed increase to the spending limit, also known as maximum indebtedness. We presented three spending scenarios to the agency board, and they chose to move forward with the highest one, which would increase the spending limit by $50 million. Based on current estimates, it's forecast that a $50 million increase would extend the district by about 19 years. And state statutes require that we estimate how much urban renewal projects will cost. It was a bit of a difficult uh, task, seeing we don't have specific projects yet. So we, we, we provided these estimates in the, in the report in your packet. These are estimates only, and they just provide guideposts to staff and generally articulate council priorities. The actual amounts will be determined as the agency board makes decision on plan and implementation. We heard very clearly from the agency board that their priority is supporting the new creation of housing, and that's where they intend to spend most of their dollar. As part of developing both the list of downtown priorities and projects and the proposed amendment, we looked to our existing plans and policies to ensure the projects were aligned with the city's established goals. I'll walk through some of those highlights. First, Envision Eugene, which I'm sure you're all more than familiar with. This work uh, supports key pillars of Envision Eugene, including providing economic opportunities, promoting compact urban development and efficient transportation options, repairing and enhancing neighborhood livability, and allowing for adaptable, flexible, and collaborative implementation. The work also supports strategies of the Regional Prosperity and Economic Development Plan, including growing local opportunities. We wanna create an environment that supports the growth of local businesses. Energizing a creative economy. We wanna be able to meet specialized physical needs for innovative or technology businesses. We wanna invest in tomorrow's talent. We hope to set a foundation for a culture for a young workforce. Current downtown hasn't historically been a draw, nor are there many options for them to live downtown. And finally, identifying as a place to thrive. A creative economy and dynamic urban center is an important asset for our area, both to grow our own businesses and to attract new investment. The Climate Action Plan 2.0 outlines how dense housing can help achieve climate goals. Generally, smaller homes have a smaller ca carbon footprint, both during construction and when lived in. Also, housing built near transit means its residents need fewer uh, trips to amenities, aka more 20 minute neighborhoods. More density is outlined as a strategy in the CAP 2.0, and urban renewal could be used to support some of the projects listed under that strategy and shown here, such as amazing, making compact development easier, allowing for more 20-minute neighborhoods, uh, incentivizing transit-oriented development, and encouraging housing diversity. The housing implementation pipeline identifies compact development as an important piece to increasing our housing supply. It helps meet the need, but also achieves other policy goals. The HIP sets the goal to increase the amount of housing downtown by 50% from the 2021 supply. That would mean the creation of over a thousand units. We're actually on track to meet that goal with the plan investments in the riverfront and the market district, but those tend to be, those are generally on the periphery of downtown. If the plan's amended, we would be working to focus on building housing in the core and would be work to develop a goal specific to the downtown core. Finally, this work is aligned with many pieces of the downtown plan. Two of the highlights include living downtown. Housing is what transforms downtown into a neighborhood. Housing is important to the health of downtown and it's generally been missing. And then building a downtown, the city needs to encourage development that provides character and density downtown to promote an active and vital area. So the amendment next steps. Uh, so the state statutes, again, require us to do a number of steps as part of the amendment process. We're reaching out to the overlapping taxing districts and we'll be presenting to both 4J School Board and the county next week. We will also be sending out a public notice mailer to all property owners in, in Eugene, um, and that's notifying them of a public hearing scheduled for May 15th. 
And then right now, council is scheduled to discuss any recommendations and comments on the amendment at their June 12th work session and take action on June 21st. So to answer any questions you may have or talk about any comments you may have. Um, and then also we've asked if you could make a recommendation to council um, about whether or not they should amend the plan. And with that, I'll hand it back to you guys for any questions. Thank you. Um, now we have any questions from planning commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Ramey. All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation, it's terrific. I understand generally how urban renewal districts work. And I have two questions for you. The last amendment in 2016, what was the amount that was added at that time? I believe it was 19.4. 19.4. The so other nods, yeah. Well, 19 to 50 is quite a, I was just trying to get some context of where we were in terms of the jump, okay. And then secondarily, do we have um, available density within given zoning to accommodate the housing that we're talking about? Are we gonna be looking at rezoning to do that? I'm hoping Alyssa might be able to jump in on that. Can jump in. Oh. So most of downtown is zoned either C2 community commercial or C3, which I think is major commercial. Neither of I mean, they both have fairly tall height limits and they don't have density limits in them. So um, I, there's, you know, there, I don't know how much vacant property there currently is, but there's certainly um, zoning potential for a fair amount of housing. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Verkula. Thank you. Um, so I have heard city council discuss um, expanding the um, downtown um, zone and the urban renewal zone um, geographically. And I'm wondering if you could explain what that process entails and um, why we're not potentially looking at it now? Yeah, that's a good question. So we are actually on a pretty tight timeline because the the district potentially expires in December, we council would have to take action on an amendment by June, um, which put us on a very tight timeline that would allow it uh, to get referred to the ballot if need be and for a vote to happen. Um, and so there has been some talk at the council table about expansion. Our recommendation to them was to get through this amendment process um, and then we could consider uh, boundary expansions in the future. It would take another amendment, but there's a lot of, I think, potential areas for expansion and we wanna be very thoughtful and strategic. Uh, uh, the district can only be expanded by so much. We can only expand by 20% of the original uh, district size. So we, we have about nine acres that we could expand. Um, so. Our plan is to get through this amendment process and then come back to them to talk about some strategic uh, areas of expansion. Great, thank you. Commissioner Bailey. <clears throat> thank you, hi. Um, I have a few questions. I First of all, did I understand correctly? Did you say the city council itself serves as the agency board? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they initiated this and then it's going back to them. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, okay, when you discuss the public input and listed six priorities and the top three were housing, safety, and um, social services. Mm -hmm. But then when you listed projects, areas you talked about housing safety and emerging projects could you address a little bit that correlation or that transition or i mean what happened to social services and how does emerging projects address the priorities that were set totally yeah so the the priorities aren't meant to be a clear like connection to the bucket so the buckets exist outside of those three priorities. Um, a lot of the projects listed under social services and public safety can't be paid for with urban renewal dollars just by the, they, we can't pay for operational um, things. Um, so the city is looking at other ways to address the projects in there. And so as part of the city manager's proposed budget, there's quite a few different models that she's uh, introducing to kind of work on some of those operations, including uh, bringing 
she's proposed bringing in uh, an incident commander for downtown to address um, uh, short term emerging like emergency needs in the downtown. Um, and they're also looking at um, earmarking dollars for behavioral health um, because I think they're working out what that model would look like. So the city's working on those other pieces in tandem with this and the urban renewal dollars are focused on what what's urban renewal eligible within that that priority. I see. I see. And um, if I recall correctly, page 44 of the plan has a lot of blank blanks where numbers could get filled in possibly. And it's in that paragraph where they talked about downtown area being blighted. And mm -hmm. I, I'm interested in knowing what those numbers are. Yeah, yeah. So the the report that you got is still in draft format. We're working on finishing it up. Um, and so the ordinance that so they're having a public hearing on the ordinance on the fifteenth, and in that version there will be uh that will have the number. We we I have the numbers in a file to be updated, and we can make sure that that final ordinance gets gets to this group, um, which has the numbers. sent to us. Yeah, that that would be helpful. Um. I, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Commissioner Beeson. Thanks. Um, I don't know that I have any questions. I I have some comments. Um, I went back and listened to the council work sessions January and then the one earlier this month. And it's uh, certainly don't want to speak for the council. I think if you sit and listen to those, one of the things you hear pretty much across the board is uh, a desire to develop uh, housing downtown. Very strongly stated a number of times. Um, I also wanna say, I appreciate all the material, uh, appreciate the packet. Um, I, I found the report pretty helpful. Um, I watched the process over the last couple of years as you engage the community in discussion of downtown priorities. And uh, I think that we've done a pretty effective job kind of gathering that information and input from the community and then kind of translating it into this uh, a met potential amendment to the for urban renewal to get house more housing developed. Um, I'm at this point, I'm really ready to approve uh, the recommendation back to the council that we uh, adopt or that they adopt or back to the board, excuse me, back to the agency board that they adopt the uh, proposed amendment and uh, without any modification. I say that understanding fully that there's a public hearing coming up. There's uh, comments from the community and that the council is going to meet subsequent to that to make a decision. Um, but I think uh, the amendment clearly based on pretty substantive public review about downtown needs. Um, I think also as you review the work sessions the agency board has done some pretty detailed review and discussion, pretty critical discussion in parts. Uh, and uh, they, again, they support this increase in the debt ceiling and uh, on the authorization for the spending in these project categories that you've talked about. And it's also pretty clear there aren't any projects really at this point. They're going to be identified as they go along and there will be additional authorization and public review at the time of each one of those, at least for those that are in excess of 250,000 is kind of the way I'm reading it. Um, I think it's also I I it's uh, I really like to see I've, it, uh, it it's kind of front and center in the material that these amendments that are proposed are consistent with the various plans that we have, and you you point those out and you explain that all in detail and I I'm I'm just uh, appreciative of that I think you know doing that on an ongoing basis is a very good thing to do. Um, so I, I'm uh, at this point. I think I'm ready. Uh, we go forward to um, approve a recommendation that we send it back. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Beeson. Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Chair Isaacson. Um, I have a question that's on more kind of on the process side, and I'm just kind of curious. So. 
this, you know, staff is hoping for this body to kind of make a recommendation. And I'm just kind of curious what, you know, there's a public hearing that's happening on the 15th. And so it, it seems a little bit out of order to me and maybe I'm missing something, but I just, just, I know the devil's always in the details. And so, and I think that this is a, a more iterative process. And so I, I, my concern is just like, sending something forward for a recommendation at this sort of high level if that's kind of more what you're looking for as they continue to kind of whittle down and, and refine specifics i guess i'm just trying to figure out what you know maybe why the planning commission's recommendation at this moment or at this point in time preceding the hearing is some somehow makes sense i don't know Commissioner Edwards, I'll jump in and I'll, <laughs> but I'll also let Amanda speak to your question. Um, I, you know, as I was sitting here thinking about your good question, I think it's maybe worth pointing out for Planning Commission and, and also the folks that might be watching that this is a different process than Planning Commission is used to. This is not a land use regulation. Um, so we're not going through the typical process that you've seen with the Middle Housing Code Amendments and Greenway that lives in Chapter 9. This is, and it's not a land use plan or a land use decision. The reason that the Urban Renewal Plan Amendment is coming to Planning Commission is that this is a state law requirement in the urban renewal statutes. Um, so before the council can adopt an ordinance amending an urban renewal plan, they need to go out and ask for comments from a number of entities, including the city's planning commission, um, also including overlapping taxing districts. So the other taxing districts that for whom real property taxes are collected within the urban renewal district. In this case, Amanda can help me remember, but it's the city, the county, um, four day school district, Lane Community College district, and Upper Willamette Soil and Water Conservation District, I think. And and Lane ESD. And Lady ESD, thank you. Um, so all of, staff is in the process of reaching out to all of those districts and soliciting comments. And then there's also a public hearing, which is the opportunity for kind of a general public to submit comments. Um, and council will be, all that information will be provided to council. And then council will have a work session to consider all that information before they take action on the plan amendment. So unlike a land use regulation where planning commission is really um, acting as kind of the the first cut technical analysis body. Um, I think this is it, you're just in a little bit of a different position. Not that you couldn't do that work here too, but it really is just kind of like, hey, planning commission, what do you think about this proposed amendment? Um, and like in a land use regulation, you could recommend approval, approval with modifications or denial. You have those options. Mm -hmm. um, but the council will be getting similar information and comments from a variety of different sources and then taking all of that into account before they make their decision. And my guess in terms of you know why staff is coming to planning commission before the public hearing in this instance is partially just because of the tight timeline and needing to get on planning commission schedule and needing to get on council schedule for the public hearing and just kind of doing the best they can with what they have timing wise. That is super helpful. Um, I have sort of a follow-up comment, um, if that's okay, chair. Um, <laughs> they, I'm, I'm, I am supportive and I will say that very specifically, I'd like to see um, the use of specifically to to generating the type of housing that then generates additional revenues that can be generated. And so I know so much of the housing that we have in the area doesn't, because it's subsidized or because of other reasons, it, it we haven't maximized the potential of being able to capture additional tax revenues, which to me is the whole point of urban renewal funds. It's it's intended to be investments that then help to grow that pot. And so, I, you know, I'd like to see us maximize 
and have that kind of be the question that the district is asking or the agent with the, the body um, is asking themselves as they're appropriating funds is that, you know, how, what is this return of investment and how is this going to continue to perpetuate more revenue generating projects and things like that. So I think market rate is key. Um, and so I just kind of want to put that out there, but I also think that I'm super supportive of expanding the, um, use, uh, specifically around housing. And I think it's very well aligned with the planning commission's, um, bylaws and what we are tasked with as a body. So, um, I'm, I'm supportive. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, commissioner Frankel, do you have a, a motion or something to say? Um, yeah, so I also am supportive and I appreciate the focus on housing. Um, and I do have a motion. So, um, I move to recommend that the city council adopt the proposed amendments to the downtown urban renewal plan shown in attachment a, as well as the accompany report in attachment B. Second. Mr. Beeson seconds. I do have, uh, it's open for discussion, obviously. Do you want to speak to your motion, uh, Lisa, or have you essentially already done that? Um, I, I feel like I have. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bailey, do you want to speak to the motion? Um, I don't know that it actually speaks to the motion. I just have a request for a little more information. Um, which will not actually impact, I don't think, the motion. So do you want to complete the motion first? Or I just thought perhaps we could have a little more. I'd like to receive more information. Well, there's a section at the end where we can talk about um, kind of follow-ups and information for commissioners. Let's let's push it to that. Um, okay. And keep the dialogue to the discussion itself. Um, Commissioner Ramey. So I, I too, uh, support the motion. And again, the, the sort of narrow role of the Planning Commission here, this obviously is is in, in alignment with existing policies and plans in the area. And from a public outreach standpoint, it seems to align with, with what we've heard from the public. Um, so the, the other issues about how big it should be or expanding the district, those are policy issues that the council can wrestle with. Um, but I think what we see before us is certainly consistent with what is needed or is identified as a need and, and reflects what the public's interested in. So for, the, for those reasons, I'll be voting in favor of this. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other comments. I'm going to call the question. Uh, all those who, uh, like officials who uh, support the motion um, to uh, adopt the proposed amendments to the downtown urban renewal plan, signify it by raising your hand. Looks like I have as a unit unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on into the next part of our agenda, uh, all which is items from commission uh, and staff members. So I think this is a good time to Commissioner Bailing, if you wanted to talk to staff, have your comments recognized. Oh, yes, thank you. I, um, it, you know, it may be that I need to go back and watch the city council meetings where they engaged in this process, or perhaps staff or Commissioner Beeson could share a little more information. I would like to understand better how it is that the conclusion was reached that um, adding housing is kind of the answer to everything for improving the situation downtown and eliminating blight and uh, does that all just get flushed out further in their later discussions? I I think there needs to be a lot more than just housing to make it workable. There is not walkable goods and services. If you live there, you'd have to leave to find a market. You know, there's there's a lot more to it. I think than just housing and I'm sorry, I'm ignorant. I haven't been a part of the discussions in the past and I didn't see those city council meetings. So perhaps that would um, answer the questions, but I'd love to hear from you all who have been a part of the process about what the bigger picture is and the vision. Commissioner 
And Thank you, Sabrina. Yeah, and do you want to jump in? I think she can speak from an economic side of why the focus, why we're focused on housing. Sure, happy to. Um, Commissioner, I think that's a, that you're asking a really important fundamental question to all of this. We're, we're the primary council has directed us to that they want the bulk of the funds to go to housing, but the plan is not only funding housing because you're right, you can't have, just housing doesn't solve the problem. However, right now with, Downtowns across the globe are all facing this problem of vacancies in office buildings are much higher than they were three years ago. It's going to be a long time before those offices are full again. And, and so a solution to it is to possibly convert existing underused buildings to housing or redevelop buildings underused, like there's some vacant lots, super underutilized sites, develop into new housing. But that would also, but more retail, we do need more retail on the ground floor, but right now there's not enough people downtown to support that retail. And I think it's kind of a little bit of a chicken and egg. You're going to want more retail to attract people, but you're going to want more people to attract retail. And so that's what this program does is incentivize both of those things. There's funds that will be available to make tenant improvements to spaces on the ground floor to help attract retails to the downtown area. And and that's and so it's it's all of those things together, really anchored by more housing downtown. It's also in line with the climate plan and all of the housing work we've done. We have an undersupply of housing. Housing in the downtown is the best way to reduce our per capita emissions. Folks living downtown are close to goods and services and employment, and they can get by possibly without a car at all. Definitely not driving every day. And so that is one way to really work towards those climate emissions goals that the city has as well. So we're addressing climate and housing and making the downtown a better place. So I, I appreciate that. And I wonder uh, in the list of the different projects, I agree very strongly with the utilization of underutilized properties and perhaps conversion to residential, but those were listed as um, emerging projects rather than in the housing bucket, if I read the report right. And I would love to see more of that in the actual housing bucket so that there is funds directed toward utilizing vacant or underutilized properties. That seems kind of like a no brainer. It, it, it is, and it is in the housing bucket. We have two very specific things in the housing bucket. One is we're able to cover development fees. SDCs, permit fees, cost to connect to EWEB's electrical system, that's all in the housing bucket. And that applies to new properties, converting an old underused property to housing. Those, the, if you convert an office building to housing that comes with a lot of bathrooms and a lot of SDCs for bathrooms. And so those funds could cover all of that work. And then also there's funds where we'll be able to buy property and dispose of it at a deep discount to incentivize housing there. In the third bucket of emerging projects, there's money for development, which is a lot more open, where if there's a chance we put out a program where we cover your SDCs and permit fees and nobody bites, maybe it's not enough to incentivize it. That third bucket for development costs gives us the flexibility that we could sweeten the pot a little bit if what we offer up at first just is unsuccessful to attract development to there. And that development can be used to fund commercial space or housing space. Great, thank you. Are there any other items from sure. any other county commissioners? City staff, do you have any announcements or anything to share? Oh, I always have announcements. Um, so tomorrow, the uh, city manager will be uh, releasing the, well, actually the budget's been released, but it's the first work session with the budget committee on uh, the budget for the um, upcoming two years. So if you're interested in that, it starts at 530. Um, and then in terms of planning commission scheduling, we're doing per usual, move, moving a few things around. Some things aren't ready. Some things make more sense to go later. So we're going to be canceling the May 9th meeting and bumping River Road to May 23rd. 
And then Goshen's going to get bumped out a little bit further than that. Um, I will send an email um, with all of that information. And also just to let you know, um, boards and commission interviews are in about a month. So that process that we have two openings and um, that process is closed for applications and the council is choosing right now who they want to interview, which will happen in late May with appointments in, um, I think it's June 12th right now is the date being looked at. Um, other things going on at council on May 8th, there will be a climate friendly update similar to what you received at your last meeting. And then on May 10th is a work session on the Greenway code amendments, which you're quite familiar with. Um, I'll just, I'll put all that in the email because that's a lot of dates coming at you um, just so you have it in front of you. And that is all that I have. Well, great. In that case, this meeting of the Gene Planning Commission is adjourned.